In this video, I'm going to tell you about section 1.2.2 in uh, Stein's Elementary Number Theory book about uh, enumerating the primes, how to do that, uh, sort of the prime number sieve, if you will. And uh, I'll also tell you about the largest known prime. So to start off, let's talk about the uh, prime number sieve. And so how do we make, um, you know, a list of, say, the first 100 primes? You know, how would you tell a computer to do that? What would kind of the basis for the algorithm be? This is actually kind of really cool. So here is the algorithm for um, a basic prime number sieve. So given some positive integer n, the following is gonna compute a list of primes up to that number. So the first step is to initialize your set x, and x is gonna consist of all odd integers between three and whatever your n is. So if it was, uh, say, n is 100, then I'm gonna go all the odds from three to 100, say. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off my list of primes, which I'll call p, P is gonna just be the list that has two in it. Now, here's how the algorithm works. Um, if you're at the point where P is the first element of your set X, so like in this case, it looks like three. Um, if it's the case that P is larger than the square root of N, then what you should do is take every element of your set X and just add it to P, and then you're done, and your list P contains all the primes. Otherwise, you just take P and apply it to uh, your list of primes. So then what do you do? You're gonna set, you go to the next step, and where this is a cross-off step, like it says, you're gonna set x equal to all the elements that are in x that are not divisible by p, and then repeat the process. So that might be a little bit much to take in at once. So let's take a look at uh, maybe how would we figure out what are the primes less than or equal to 40 that use the sieve. So here's what we do, right? I set the list of primes that I know as two. Say two is the prime that I know, and I'm gonna list all the odd integers up to 40. Now here's what it says. It says to start with the first element of x. So p is the first element of x. And uh, otherwise, we're gonna append p so I guess maybe I should say this too. Um, three is not bigger than the square root of 40, so we should append p to my list of primes. So we're gonna take three, and we're gonna add three to my list with two in it. And now in the next step, what it says to do, we go to the cross off step here, we're gonna cross out all the multiples of three. So I'm gonna take this out, this out, what else? Oh gosh, I gotta do this on the spot. I think I can do it though, and this one. So now I've got my new set x, which is this, and now I'm just gonna apply the same game. I'm gonna look at five. I'm gonna ask myself, hey, is uh, that bigger than the square root of 40? And in this case, no. Nope. Well, then that means five itself must be prime. And the next thing we'll do is we'll cross off all the multiples of five in our list. And what I think that you see is that our list is gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and then when does it stop? Well, it gets to the point, or I guess, uh, sorry, we stop whenever um, five is bigger then, I'm sorry, our, 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 our first element in the list is bigger than the square root of 40, which would be the next step at seven. And so you see that uh, in that case, once I have, once I cross these off, in fact, I think I've stopped there, right? My list with this the, uh, multiples of five crossed off is right here. And uh, because seven squared is larger than 40, uh, seven satisfies this criteria up here, which is when that tells me to append every element of x to p and terminate. So in other words, all of these here are going to be appended in my list of p. So my list p so far before that, p was two, three, five, and now we're at the step now where we're gonna take everything from here and add it to our list. And so uh, just to kind of recap that very quickly, he says that this is the new p right here, which is pretty cool. And so here's kind of the proof of how that algorithm uh, part of it anyway. And so um, one of the things that's not super clear is when the first element of your set X, so like the first odd number left in your set X, whenever it's larger than or equal to the square root of N, in other words, like how many primes are you trying to list out up to say, you know, 100, um, why is it the case that each element that remains in the set is prime. So in other words, like how can we prove in general that once I'm at this step right here, because seven squared is bigger than or equal to 40, why do I know that everything that's in this, that's uh, it's not really clear what I'm pointing to, why, why is it, why do I know that all of these have to be prime numbers? So that is what um, uh, Stein explains in this part of the proof here. That's what he's gonna prove. Um, and so if we take a look at that, it's a nice proof by contradiction. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna suppose that M is an element of my set of uh, odd numbers up to N. 
so that in particular, right, m is somewhere between the square root of n and n, and that we're also going to assume by way of contradiction that m is not divisible by any prime that's less than or equal to the square root of n. Now, m is some natural number, so it has a prime factorization. If you've never seen this notation before, it's like a big summation operator, except summations for addition. This pi symbol is for multiplication. So like, what is this thing? This is the same thing as saying like p1 raised to the e1 power times p2 raised to the e2 power, blah, 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 times, you know, some pm, or I shouldn't use n, pk raised to the uh, ek power, where each of these are like your exponents on your prime. So maybe just to give you one more concrete example, um, let me think about what's a good one. How about um, 18 is equal to 3 squared times 2, right? So like uh, the way that I'm writing this, um, maybe P1 is equal to 3, uh, E1 is equal to 2, that exponent, and P2 is equal to 2. Uh, it should be a 2 there, sorry about that. So I hope you're okay with uh, how that notation works. But anyway though, so what are we gonna do? Well, I know that M has a prime factorization. I'll write it out this way. And what else can I assume when I write it, just like I've done here, when I write the prime factorization, uh, that each one of the P's that I have is distinct. And that's what the exponent's for. So that uh, you know, three only occurs once in this. I only have to write three down because I'm allowed to use an exponent to express it. That's all we're trying to say here. And let's say that I put them in order too. So that I, the way that I wrote these, they're not in order. So maybe if I switched them around, I'm gonna relabel this as uh, two is gonna be P1 and three squared. So uh, P2 is gonna be three. So again, we're just gonna relabel things so that uh, the order of the primes is increasing as the index increases. Now, let's think about, there's two possibilities then for uh, the primes that are, occur as the factors of m. It's either the case that all of the primes in the factorization are bigger than the square root of n, or it's the case that at least one of the primes in this factorization is less than the square root of n. So they're either all bigger than the square root of n, or at least one is less than the square root of n, right? That's, that's like an event and it's complement. So that's all possibilities. So well, for case one, right? If all the pi in the prime factorization of m are larger than the square root of n, and if there's more than one pi, think about that. That would mean when you multiply them together, you'd get something that's a larger number than n. So this m that you have is a bigger number than n, which contradicts the fact that we chose uh, m to be less than or equal to n. So that's not good. So that can't happen. So our other possibility is that at least one of the pi, there has to be some pi that's less than or equal to the square root of n. But uh, in that case, that is a problem as well, because I assume that no prime that divides m is less than or equal to the square root of n. So both things lead to a contradiction. Therefore, uh, this kind of overall hypothesis here must be garbage. So that's the contradiction. So that proves why that algorithm works. In other words, why can I just say that this list in this example right here is just gonna get thrown into P and I know that I'm done. So that's kind of the proof of that stuff. So going down, this next part's a little bit fun and it also introduces a concept that we'll run into a little bit later on when we get into some of the cryptography things in this class. Uh, so what's the largest known prime number? I'll say a little bit more about that too. Um, so here's a little definition here, our Mersenne prime. It's a prime that has the form two to a power minus one. Now be very careful when it says this. What we're not saying is that two to a power minus one is always prime. We're just saying that when such a number is prime, we'll call it a Mersenne prime. So as of uh, 2007, uh, the largest known prime number was actually the 44th Mersenne prime that we know, which was, is this number right here, two raised to this mind-bogglingly high power minus one. Now this book was written in 2017, and I just did a little Google search before I started making this video, if you just Google Mersenne primes. And in fact, a year later in 2018, uh, researchers have found what we know as the uh, biggest Mersenne prime, which is, again, mind-boggling, two raised to the 82 million blah, 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 blah power minus one. So that is currently the largest Mersenne prime uh, that we know about. If you think that stuff's pretty cool, I uh, invite you to go look at it on the internet, which is pretty good stuff. Um, in that case though, those are the kind of numbers again that um, I don't know how long it takes to 
<laughs> for computers to to figure out oh my goodness this is a this is actually a prime number can you imagine how long it takes to try to figure out if this thing is factorable or not but maybe that idea that's uh you know some of these gigantic exponents that we have here those are again what kind of allow us to uh do some some cybersecurity kinds of things these these kind of invite us to make crypto systems based on um the fact that it's very hard for computers to factor to factor numbers. Down here is just a little bit of Sage code. Um, you know, he defines what, again, as of 2007, what the largest prime number was here. But you know, don't don't try to print P or anything like that. But what we can do is ask Sage, okay, tell me how many digits are in P. In other words, you know, how many digits are in this ridiculous number here? And uh, that number has, can I can I get this right? Looks like nine million eight hundred eight thousand. 358 digits in it. If you do go down here, um, all we do, and we won't do too much with this, but uh, you can convert that number P, so P is saved up here. You can convert it uh, into a string, which uh, as far as computer science goes, um, think about it as just like a sequence of characters where you're not doing any math to it. And then what we can do is we can kind of slice that up a little bit. So that like this thing here, this tells us with the, with the uh, syntax here with the brackets and the colon and the 20 what that does for us is it tells us what are the first 20 digits of this number p or if i switch this around to minus 20 this is going to tell me the last 20 digits of that gigantic number and what you see is because this number is ridiculously huge you know he says in parentheses this is going to take a very long time um, by the way just because um, just because it's here and maybe you haven't had a lot of computer science stuff uh, you know, this comments, or I guess this pound sign is a comment, right? So when you're in Sage and you run this, Sage isn't gonna do anything with this. That's just for someone who's reading your code to see what's going on or if you wanted to tell them something else. And also too, this isn't necessarily the type of stuff that you need to commit to memory for my class by any means at all. Um, this book is fantastic about really giving you all the computer programming code that's, uh, that, that you need in order to work some of the problems. You don't have to really do too much um, as far as research um, about how to do too much other stuff with computer programming. The book is pretty self-contained.